Oh, hey, what's going on, guys? Uh, Keto RX Six here. Can see you guys come in. Uh, just at work today. It's uh, October first, so uh, yesterday we got the uh, Age of Extinction movie on uh, Blu-ray here. So I uh, watched this, and uh, I guess a lot of you are trying to figure out what my opinion on the movie was. Don't worry, I took notes. So let's discuss this movie, and uh, we're just going to come right out and say it that <sighs> I was just really disappointed. Um, I wasn't expecting much, and I got even less than I expected. Um, yeah, so let's talk about some of the problems, and I'm going to kind of do this in mostly an order based on what we saw in the movie. And Let me tell you, if I missed a part, it's probably because... Even though I wasn't really tired yesterday, there were points in the movie that I just flat out fell asleep watching this thing. So, uh, I don't know. Let's talk about it. So we start the movie, and we've got the metal dinosaurs, and, you know, apparently that is going to change all of history. But then how does that explain the fossils and stuff that already exist that aren't metal? I don't know. I don't get it. So, uh, you know, we then cut to our first meeting of Cade, and he goes to an old movie theater and we hear the uh, owner of the theater say how uh, you know sequels and remakes are uh, crap and uh, you know the movie pretty much nailed it it's like in the first five minutes of the movie the movie comes out and says F you enjoy the ride um, that's how I took it at least anyway and uh, so Kate finds a bunch of crap and he sees the beat up Optimus truck there uh, in the middle of the movie theater and starts inquiring about it and Nobody apparently knows that the uh, truck was there, so yeah. How, how do you not notice a semi-truck suddenly appeared in the middle of your movie theater, um, even if you are just selling the junk? So then after we switch to meeting Tess's character, who we get told later in the movie is only 17 years old, and uh, the first thing she says is we've got two more weeks until we can get tan and get wasted great role model that you're setting up here that we have this underaged person who's going to go and you know get completely wasted and doesn't give a crap about school uh, that's our heroes at least one of them uh, our other hero Cade he uh, apparently doesn't pay his bills or anything so when the realtors start showing his house which I guess he I'm not really sure how they show the house with him still in it um, I don't know, maybe they do that with the foreclosure. I don't know. But uh, he basically starts threatening to beat the crap out of her and her husband and starts throwing baseball bat at her car and stuff. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that assault's not really okay, Cade. So, uh, yeah. We then switch to the scene where the humans are hunting down Ratchet and, you know, we're told Transformers are the problem and they're gonna, you know, try to eliminate all of them. It's us versus them, but lockdown works with the evil government guys and that's okay um, obviously it's because transfertanium yes it's as stupid as it sounds but uh, transfertanium which is what the transformers are made out of is a resource that this uh, seed which is essentially a bomb can create and uh, so you know the government just wants to get one of these bombs to make this uh, seed Type thing, or I'm sorry, this transfertanium stash, the, all this transfertanium they'll ever need, supposedly. Uh, my problem with that is, is based on how the humans are acting in this movie, why do we not just kill Lockdown and take his stuff? You know what I'm saying? Like, why would you barter with him if Transformers are a problem? So, it doesn't make sense. We cut back to the farm and Optimus, you know is fixed enough by Cade that he's jump-started again or whatever. His first words are, I'll kill you, which is totally Optimus Prime. I mean, you know, 30 years I've been a fan of the franchise, and I've always thought of Optimus Prime as a murderer. And uh, so Cade sends out his friend who is... I don't even remember what his name is. That's how important he was to the story, uh, to the hardware store, to come back with stuff. And he seems to come back with, like, some bolts and some duct tape and... Apparently duct tape fixes Transformers. There's such advanced technology that your local hardware store will fix the Transformer. That makes a whole bunch of sense. Um, yeah. So, you know, the Earth guys come crash 
or the government guys, I should say, come crash the barn because, uh, you know, they get word from Cade's friend that there's a Transformer there and, uh, you know, threaten to kill his daughter and all this stuff. And this is the kind where we first see the car who I swear didn't have a driver when he pulled up, making you think it was another Transformer. But, uh, you meet her boyfriend, uh, what was his name? Shane. So, uh, yeah, you meet Shane who, you know, saves them. They all jump in his car and they go plowing through all the fields and stuff like that because he's a rally car driver. So he just happens to know how to do all this stuff. And, uh, you know, apparently Tess has been, even though Marky Mark's character, Cade, has just met this Shane person, uh, Tess has apparently been his navigator for who knows how long. Uh, and he had no idea, and so, uh, takes him through, like, a, a, a parking garage or something, and, you know, flying through this parking garage at presumably, like, you know, 60, 70, 80 miles an hour through the parking garage, um, he, uh, Shane makes the statement, grab my stick, which very much sounds like grab my dick, and, uh, you know, because they're going to do this maneuver that they've practiced, and I don't really know why you would practice jumping off the fifth floor to a ramp and never once have had a problem with it. But yeah, so there's this magic ramp that just so happens to be constructed there out of metal, and uh, that's how they elude the uh, government guys. But this whole time, there's this battle going on between Optimus and Lockdown, and... It, it's, it's happening close enough. Once they do the magic ramp jump, uh, they crack the rim on his awesome Chevy Sonic. Uh, who knew those words would exist? Not really awesome, but uh, yeah, that's what happens. And so they all get out of the car, and Optimus shows up in his truck mode because Lockdown let him get away long enough, apparently. So they're all running for Optimus, and the friend that will, will remain unnamed because, again, he's not important to the story, gets vaporized. And, uh, at this point, the government's like, yep, good game, they got away, you know? Like, they are in the same area, there's helicopters following them, well, I think the helicopter went off to refuel, but lockdown's there, certainly there's other, you know, uh, of the government agencies, like, in the area, and, uh, they're just like, oh, they got to Optimus, the one guy got vaporized, good game, you know? And that's it, they call off the, the attack, and Optimus and crew get away. Which is just crazy to me. I don't, I don't understand how that happens. So, uh, you know, we get a little more time where we get some background on Shane and Tessa. And uh, we find out Shane is 20. And, you know, finally that we find out Tessa is 17. So, you know, congratulations on the statutory rape, I suppose. Um, but it's okay because apparently Shane gets asked this a lot. And so much so that he carries a card in his wallet that... Uh, you know, basically says the Romeo and Juliet clause of the law that says if you ha were in this relationship uh, prior to being legally an adult, it's okay. So presumably they started dating when she was 14 and he was 17, I guess it would have to be. Um, okay, I guess, I suppose, but to have a card in your wallet, that's a little bit ridiculous. And I also don't know much about this law, but I kind of don't think it applies, uh, as the parent also, I believe, has to consent to the relationship, and if they object, then you are not safe by that law. Uh, fairly certain. Not entirely sure. Um, we also get a little more exposition on, uh, Cade, who takes the drone thing and hooks it up to, like, a Commodore 64 controller and can magically fly it around and see what's going on, and, uh, so we get an ATM machine where he puts the card in the slot and uh, he still got no money. That's a big surprise. Or apparently he did have money in the bank but we didn't know about it and they shut it down. I'm not sure which one. Uh, which leads me to believe or start thinking about what happened to the movies in, or the humans that were in the first three Transformers films. Uh, you know like Sam and uh, I don't know whoever else. Um, and the way that the evil government guys come after Cade and crew, um, I've come to the conclusion that I think that Sam and his family and all the troops that were involved with the Transformers and stuff, 
they were all taken and executed for, you know, working with uh, the aliens, you know. So, uh, yeah, Sam and crew are dead. And I'm just going to leave it at that because I, I feel like that's, that's the only reasonable explanation for why there's no Sam and stuff in the movie. Not that I wanted them in the movie, but the way that the humans are, or the, the government guys are coming after these particular human protagonists, it just leads you to think that uh, they have to be dead. Um, so we get a little bit of an explanation later as we go to this KSI place where they explain what transfertanium does and it can uh, change anything into anything, which is pretty awesome. So it's like T-1000 from Terminator 2, but made out of cubes instead. And uh, this is where we first get to see Galvatron, who's uh, apparently modeled after Optimus, but he just keeps looking like Megatron, which kind of leads you to believe that something about the robot itself is letting the Megatron personality come through and this happens later when they release Galvatron and he starts doing uh, you know firing missiles and stuff that he wasn't programmed to do and you know there's a bunch of red flags that but you know it's okay we'll just there's no problem there so you know we come back to Kate and crew and they're coming up with this scheme to break into KSI and I don't entirely know the reason they want to break into KSI um, yeah, I just, I can't remember. I honestly don't know. There was so much going on that uh, it's hard to follow why people wanted to go where and for what. But anyway, they're planning to break in. Uh, you see Shane and Tessa kiss, and uh, Cade makes this comment about, uh, you know, no smooching and stuff like this. And then uh, there's a conversation between him and Optimus who says that he had gone through the same thing with Bumblebee. I honestly found that really interesting. I kind of wanted to know who Optimus caught Bumblebee smooching and, uh, you know, all that thing because the story this far wasn't really holding my attention. I kind of wanted to see that more. Is that wrong? I don't know. Maybe. Anyway, so they break into KSI or going to. They have these cards that, you know, magically they got the cards. I don't even know where the, you know, the, the, the cards for, you know, the scanner systems would actually come from, but they got one in Bumblebee and prints their data on it. So, uh, yeah, there's that. And uh, as they're pulling up to the gates, uh, Shane, who, let me remind you, a couple scenes earlier was driving at like 80 miles an hour towards walls and stuff and making leaps of faith and stuff like that, is now a complete nervous wreck. So that that makes a lot of sense that dealing with a, an, an, an individual, he's a pro he's not confident, but, you know, the whole going towards the wall like a, a madman or, you know, running from the cops. He's not even nervous at all. So, yeah, I didn't understand that. Um, something happens, and we end up on lockdown ship. Uh, I don't know exactly what happens. I know that uh, Cade told Tessa to run for the field, and instead she runs into a car, and, you know, she's always blaming all her problems on him, even though she doesn't listen to him. But anyway, so she goes in the car and, you know, they get on the ship somehow. And while she's on the ship, there's, like, this super Japanese tentacle porn type scene with some alien that's in one of Lockdown's cages. Um, yeah. And so Cade goes on the ship to try to save her, and so do the Autobots to, you know, try to slow down the ship leaving or whatever. And, uh, yeah, because they Lockdown got Optimus by shooting him, I believe, twice through the chest. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But, uh, anyway, so Cade's on the ship looking around, and he finds some weapons. Now, arguably, knowing the lore lockdown is a collector of sorts, you know, he likes to collect upgrades. And, uh, so presumably these weapons are from different races or something like that. But, uh, you know, when I looked at it, they kind of look like Transformers weapons. The, the sword turns into a gun. Um, and I don't even know if it's fair to call it a sword. If it is a transformer weapon, it's probably more like a dagger, which would question why the gun would be so powerful, uh, you know, against transformers. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, it, it's, it's like hiding a small gun inside a small weapon for a transformer. That's what it ultimately was. And, uh, yeah, I don't, I just don't get it. But, the weapons seemed like they were completely weightless. I believe there's a scene where he picks one up and throws it with one hand to whomever else was there. I can't even remember anymore. But, uh, yeah, there's just no weight to them, so 
you know, why is the weapon so strong? Is it a Transformers weapon? Is it just a weapon from another race that Lockdown Collective kind of would have been cool if Lockdown collected some kind of, like, Earth tech and put it in the collection to say, like, hey, this is, uh, you know, this is his collection of exotic, you know, for him, weapons. Um, so, yeah, we'll skip to a couple scenes later. Optimus now seeks the Dinobots for reinforcements because things are pretty grim. And uh, so he fights Grimlock, um, and he says the words, I'm giving you freedom. And then he says, now defend my family or die. I'm like, it's not usually a type of thing you say with freedom. It's like, uh, you know, uh, if I had, like, let's take my fiance for instance. She comes into my house and I say, you're free to do whatever you want. And she comes in and I say, now go make me dinner and get the hell out. Like, that, <laughs> that's essentially what this scene does, so... I mean, he's even holding the sword to Grimlock's throat, telling him, like, you know, do it or get out, and it doesn't make any sense to me. I really don't understand. So, uh, yeah, we get to a couple scenes. We have uh, Hound fighting, and I'm perfectly fine with him giving all the orders and, and stuff like that. But what really gets me is when he starts, like, rolling around on the floor, and he reminds me, I don't know if you've ever seen it, there's this really big guy with a samurai sword or katana, who slices all these water bottles up and like it just reminds me of that like he looks really goofy I would have rather him just stayed the tactical guy or um, you know weapons blazing guns at the ready type guy it makes no sense more stuff happens and now lockdown activates this magnetic thing on his ship to I don't know pick up metal and crush everybody and uh, it's apparently selective because you see things coming up around Cade's car, but Cade's car, you know, that all the protagonists are in, uh, is not affected by it, so that makes a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, you get your usual scenes that are locked down and Optimus fighting towards the end of the movie, and, uh, I don't know, fight scenes are pretty cool to watch. I, I didn't have a problem with them, really. Um, they're pretty identifiable. But, uh, yeah, you get the fight scenes, I won't ruin too much of it for you, um, Optimus talks about honor, stabs people in the back, stuff like that. And then he just pulls out these rocket boots and flies up into space. So completely negating the use of jet fire in movies too, and I guess in 3 because he still was carrying around that stuff. So, uh, yeah, where did those rocket boots come from? It doesn't make much sense. So uh, that's pretty much it for the actual movie things I commented on like Drift when he first shows up he's in his Bugatti form and then like the very next scene he's a helicopter coming from somewhere else like I, the scene made no sense because it showed Crosshairs, Bumblebee and Drift all driving down the road but then the next scene they're like far away they're not together again so that doesn't make any sense um, with the whole humans hunting them and they're in hiding it's kind of unclear why Drift's robot mode looks like a Japanese samurai and kind of talks like a stereotypical, you know, bad Japanese film type thing. Um, shout out to Oscar, who, as soon as Drift started talking, all I could think of is a rock of five. So, uh, yeah, to Bumblebee's credit, um, I don't really think he did any beep boops, which was pretty good. Um, he got a little pissy that he was called an old model and stuff like that, which was weird. Um, I don't know. I guess I guess it's par for the course because he did it back when, uh, you know, Sam kind of called him a piece of crap or Michaela called him a piece of crap before. So I guess good job on continuity there. Um, Optimus. So he's pretty much dying, leaking lubricant from all kinds of places and stuff when we first see him. He gets shot through the chest a bunch of times, he gets stabbed in the spark, and he still lives. Like, Transformers have died for less. Um, yeah, like, how Jazz just got ripped in half. It seems completely inconsequential when it seems that, you know, as long as the spark is still there, um, he's repairable. So it doesn't make any sense. Uh, Hound, I don't have much more to add from the scenes except that John Goodman was uh, 
I like John Goodman as the voice. I was okay with that. And uh, Cross Harris was pretty much just a scumbag. Like, you know, it's a weird character choice to add for a heroic Autobot that he doesn't care if any of his allies were alive and he could be on his own and all this stuff. So, uh, not really sure of the choice there. So, uh, I don't know. That's pretty much my summary of the movies. And uh, I don't know if I'm... If I'm really, you know, getting through my my opinion on this thing, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best to muster all the hate I can, and uh, you know, hopefully we can we can uh, let that flow. Hang on, hang on. Let me, let me get into some character here because you know I just think that it's more appropriate if we do this type of thing because then we can really really let the hate flow. And, uh, so what would I rather do than watch this movie another time? Uh, I'd rather watch the My Little Pony show. I would rather watch movies one through three again. I would rather watch nothing but the 86 movie for the rest of my life. I would like to change my channel such that I exclusively review Impossible Toys things. I would rather take a hammer to my skull repetitively than watch that movie again. I would rather do work. I would rather work than watch. You know what? I'm just gonna go back to work.